Well, welcome to Hello Chaos, a weekly podcast exploring the messy and chaotic minds and lives of founders, entrepreneurs, and innovators. Every week we talk to entrepreneurs from different industries, different company stages of all shapes and sizes. We hear the real, the raw, the unbiased founder stories and talk about the good, the great, the bad, the ugly parts of being a founder. It's why our mantra is where aha meets oh shit. We drop new episodes every Sunday. Founders can listen to us on a Sunday afternoon and get ready for the week ahead. Hello Chaos is one of the many resources brought to you by Orange Whip. That's Orange Whip, W-I-P, that stands for work in progress, because that's what we all are. Orange Whip is a multimedia company dedicated to serving founders and entrepreneurs in affiliate cities through hyper-local media platforms designed to inform, inspire, and create connections in those local areas to help founders succeed. Orange Whip is an all-in-one content hub for founders with fresh and engaging stories, curated calendars, a local dynamic roadmap to navigate the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. We've done the hard work for founders, so they only need to go to one trusted source to find all the local information they need. My name is Jennifer Sutton. My friends and family call me JJ. I'm the founder of Orange Whip and will be your host today. Today we have Katie Shields. She's the CEO and founder of Drink Tipsy. Welcome, Katie. Welcome to Hello Chaos. Hi. Happy to be here. I'm so excited that you're joining us. Me too. And today has been chaotic. So this is <laughs> this is perfect coming off the holidays and right. trying to take a vacation, although not not ever doing so successfully. Yeah. I know. We're always on. It's hard to take a break, a mental break. Um, but I hope happy holidays and happy new year. Thanks for being our first guest in twenty twenty four. <laughs> well, why don't you start us out, Katie? Tell us about your entrepreneurial journey. How did you get into this chaotic world? Sure. I Honestly, I kind of stumbled into this business. So my background, um, I was in medical device sales, and then I went into healthcare software sales and Loved the career. I loved carrying a bag. I'm a salesperson at heart. That's my favorite part of the, you know, what I'm doing now and where I shine the most. But I was just tired of the corporate grind, the travel, the, you know, quotas, not feeling completely fulfilled and knowing that everything I was working for you know, there were a lot of good things and there's a lot I learned along the way, but I knew at the end of the day, I was building up someone else's business and I really wanted to make something of my own. So in 2017, actually during my maternity leave with Oracle, um, I actually developed Charleston's first non-toxic nail salon, built that from the ground up, having no experience in that industry, just experience getting my nails done and getting <laughs> treatments and knowing what I like. And I ended up franchising that. Um, we were on a really great path and then COVID hit. And, you know, COVID was tough on everyone. So many businesses did not survive. Right. And especially, especially salons. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. The rules and regulations were overreaching with salons. Like we were like the last to reopen. Yeah. And, you know, it was just a really tough time for my employees as well. Um, I'm a mom and I had a lot of moms that were employees and juggling, you know, children, child care, school being constantly canceled and rescheduled. It was tough times for everyone. So I was very fortunate. I was approached by the founders of Clean Juice. They have around 200 locations. Yeah. And are are they the ones, are they based out of Austin? They're based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, okay. The North- yeah. The I was thinking of another. People. Okay. Yep. Cat and Landon Eccles and they're people I admire. Um, I love their ethos <laughs> and what they're about. 
And, you know, they were just calling to check in and the conversation developed. And, you know, this was a business model that really complemented what they're doing with organic juices. They are master franchisers. So they loved that I already had the template. My margins looked good. I hit my ROI with that business in 14 months. So it was really, you know, something that was well-built, well-oiled machine at that point. And I exited that in 2020. Um, During that time, or really even before that exit and acquisition, I had thought of the idea for Tipsy. We were on the boat with friends (laughs) and my husband was like, oh my gosh, y'all are making a mess. You know, you're spilling stuff everywhere. Go find something in a can. And at that time, nothing really existed. And there's still very few competitors or, that are specifically in my space. So okay. kind of sat on the idea then, you know, with COVID and being on the boat even more and drinking more, <laughs> as I think everyone was, Um A friend and I were like, we really need to pursue this. And we launched in late 2021 with much success. We started out with two relatively small distributors. um, And there were some challenges that I can talk about with, you know, the right distributors, the right manufacturers. But, um, you know, we've grown. I ended up buying out my then partner uh, last year. And we have been, you know, on, well, I'm sorry, in 2022. So we've been on, you know, the right trajectory. We're opening three new states this year. We've done several rounds of seed investment. And I'm really excited for what's to come. I think 2024 is going to be our banner year. So, so drink tipsy. It's, it's a, is it a clean beverage like in that category? Absolutely. So think of an Italian wine spritzer in a can. Okay. Um, I knew that I wanted something canned for adventure, convenience, whether you're, you know, going to tailgate for a football game um, or, you know, going to the pool and you don't want to deal with glass or rules about glass breakage, the boat, picnics. So Um, You know, there's a lot of beverages out there now that fall into, it's called RTDs, ready to drink space, but very few of them are clean. Most have, you know, a lot of preservatives, added chemicals that don't even have to be disclosed on the label, which I find problematic. And then just tons of sugar or fake sweeteners, which are almost worse, worse than sugar. Oh my God. I have so many questions for you because you, you get, uh, just in the last year, you're right. It's like the space has blown up. You've got Blake Lively. That's kind of gone full in. You've got, um, a couple other co-celebrities. I think what, uh, that's like down in Austin that have done something, you know, similar, like, I think they're called like bubbly or something like that. But yeah, it's like all of a sudden I'm, you know, you're seeing this stuff popping up everywhere. Um, yeah. So I'm going to back up a little bit. So you, you started this, the the franchise for the salon and, and so was this your first time of like, you had to go through not just building a franchise, kind of a a templated model, but then you sold it. You got acquired, right? Like during the like 2020, you're like, this is, we, we got to get out. We've got to exit. Talk to me about that process. How did that go? Like, what was the biggest challenges that you, you know, what were your lessons learned during that? Would you do anything differently um, through that process? Absolutely. Um, I've learned a lot of tough lessons as an entrepreneur, a lot of expensive lessons. There (laughs) are many MBA, right? Yes. My husband always says, you're getting the most expensive NBA out there. And I've become a very expensive wife (laughs) with all of my endeavors. But, you know, they've always ended up paying off. Um, With the acquisition, the actual acquisition went pretty smoothly because the people acquiring me 
they are fair, they're reasonable, they knew exactly what they wanted. I was very clear and transparent about what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So there really was not a lot of back and forth. The biggest challenge was, you know, I like to operate with integrity and Mm -hmm. honesty. And during that time, you know, we're trying to get people to come back to work and figure out schedules and also deal with, you know, the customers and some of their fears. And it was just a really chaotic time period to manage anyhow. Yeah. Um, When we reopened though, that June, we had actually one of our best months ever. It was like record number of sales. People, People were ready to get their nails done. (laughs) <laughs> People were so ready. And, you know, we had to navigate because there were so many opinions about how things were being handled. And that was really hard to navigate. Looking back, there's like things that I certainly could have done differently as far as how I communicated. But it was just a really stressful time period financially. And emotionally, you know, at that time I had two children under the age of three and we had just franchised and I knew that we were going to be ramping up with tipsy. So, and I mentioned to you, we flip houses. So we were building a house, uh, a custom build. We flip and move every two years. And it's like my friends always joke that I thrive on chaos. So yep. this is a perfect podcast for me to be on, <laughs> apparently. Um, but, you know, the hardest part was really fairly and transparently communicating with my team yeah. and ensuring that the transition was smooth for them. That they're, the, 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 new, the new owners were going to be correct. And, similar. And, being fair and honest. And if you even go in today, it's called free code. Mm-hmm. Most of the people that I hired originally in 2017 First. are still there. Oh, that's a so yeah. I think that says a lot about me and about the new owners. Um, you know, it's not an easy business to be in either. There's a yeah. lot. If you think about it, there's a nail salon in every shopping center right. in America. So you know, I'm proud of what I built and I'm proud of what they have continued. I think they have like five or six locations now. Wow. And um, I know that they'll continue to grow that business. So did you have, get investors and and, um, have kind of startup, I guess, VCs or whatever, angel investors for that? Or did you? No. So I started that business with about 150K of my own money. Okay. Um, We got to our return on that investment in 14 months, which was pretty incredible. Um, My biggest issue was being understaffed always. There were never enough employees to service the amount of customers that we could have had in the building at any given time. So um, it was a pretty safe business model, though. Would I tell people, like, don't outkick your coverage, especially when it comes to retail. Like, it's better to have a small space that you can manage and hit your numbers and get profitable quickly. And then you can always sublease that space to someone else if you grow out of it, right? Right. And um, so that's, you know, where I see, you see so many businesses, especially, I don't know what the statistics are, but brick and mortar businesses are hard, especially yeah. if you're not experienced. And what we're seeing in Charleston, love it or hate it, there's, you know, even with these restaurant groups, it's a lot of like big groups that are VC and PE funded. And they have, you know, a whole operations team, finance team, they've got the financial backing. And of course, you know, they can open up a five, 6,000 square foot restaurant and decorate it, you know, to the nines. And, you know, that's hard for someone who's local and self-funded. So, you know, and they're still struggling. I mean, they struggle just as much of recruitment, onboarding, Yes, you know, so they've got, you know, big money behind them, 
but they face some of the same challenges and their their stats are similar to to the local businesses of like 50 percent might yeah. close their doors yeah i and, know and i think the stresses um, though just the to build it organically um with your own and i mean that's it's it's more of that anxiety that stress uh, because you you are really local um, yeah it was a lot of pressure and, you know, there were a lot of sleepless nights. Now I look back at, you know, how capital intensive my current business is. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that was a cakewalk. <laughs> like as far as the financial aspect, yeah. like now I'm in a business that is, you know, it it's lower margins. It takes time to grow your sales and it's in some ways a lot more high touch because yeah. you're working through distributors and all of their sales teams but you've got retailers and their their CPG sales CPG is so not easy. It, it's not. It's, it's not, not easy. the pain of heart and right. you know I get a lot of phone calls and LinkedIn messages from people that are like I want to start my own company. And I'm like, I should go into consulting on the <laughs> side because I could tell people, you know, oftentimes all of the pitfalls to avoid. Yeah. And, you know, I don't pretend that everything is rosy and perfect and smooth sailing because it's not. Yeah. Um, what I always say is don't let the highs be too high. Keep yourself humble <laughs> but proud of what you're doing and don't let the lows be too low because there will be a lot of lows as That's well. Right. And you gotta, you gotta keep yourself motivated and encouraged. So let me ask it, Katie, when you said, you know, here you exit, did you um, have to deal with that yourself? Did you get a lawyer to help? Was that more of like, Hey, we know these people Let's sit down or did you have to bring like a team to help you figure out your evaluation to figure out, you know, what, what is a fair value um, sure. for your business? How did you how did you go through that? So it was actually pretty simplistic, and I I don't want to pretend like my particular situation is common. I think you know it was easier because I knew what the typical valuation was in that industry you know, you're looking at two to three X of revenue, and then it depends on how healthy your margins are. Um, I did have other offers, but I wanted the legacy of a clean organic nail salon to continue. And I wanted it to go to the right buyers right. for the sake of my team and my reputation. Um, so it was a pretty straightforward process. We didn't even use a broker. <laughs> I had my CPA help me with the valuation and establishing, you know, where we thought um, the appropriate number was. And they kept me on to do consulting for like three or four months. And, you know, that made for a smooth transition. They just paid me a, an agreed upon monthly rate. And, um, it was very straightforward. And, you know, we've been through the valuation process now with Tibsy. I was going to ask you, like, because because it's a whole different, I mean, it's literally a different business. Um, you've got, it's a product, it's it's consumer packaged goods, it's, you yes. know, that you've got to go through a whole two-step channel of wholesaler, distributor to then retail of, I got to get into the shelves. Now, how do yep. I get off the shelves? Um and, and deal with the consumer. But, and you said that you, you got investors. So you've got your private equity, you've got VC. How did you go through that process to like, when you start was it, did you do that from the start before you said, look, this is my brand. This is what I want to do. Or did you step into that like a year later? And that's like, we can't scale unless we get some investment help. Talk, yeah. talk to me about that process. Sure. So it was definitely more of the latter part. So we were self-funded, you know, upon launch. Um, if I had to do things differently at that time, especially, you know, when we had the idea, really it was 2019, even prior to that. But when we really went full speed ahead, I wish we had done a raise because okay. the raises back then 
were so favorable. And, you know, these financial investors were like just giving away money. Right. Um, it was a different economic environment. Um, looking back though, everything happens for a reason. So we were self-funded and definitely spent more than we anticipated to launch. There were a lot of manufacturing issues. I mean, As a, just because you, you developed this product like this. Like, so you had to go figure out ingredients. Yeah. Um, so you pay a formulator and they help, you know, they're food scientists right. and they understand you know, shelf studies, ingredients, where to source, but that process takes time. There's samples being shipped back and forth, or you're flying there and trying the samples. So, you know, and also with what I'm doing, it, it, my resources and materials are more limited because we are using organic and clean and we don't compromise on those standards. So, you know, if you're just making a malt flavored beverage, you can go directly to almost any co-packer or brewery right. and they can do that, throw in natural flavors and charge nearly the same as what I charge for a premium wine cocktail. Gotcha. So, you know, it was just a different path to success, definitely a much longer path to success. But when you look at valuations, especially with alcohol, what an acquisition company is looking for is, you know, market penetration, going deep, not casting your net too wide. Because if you're getting acquired by a Gallo or a Constellation or someone even much smaller, they have typically the expertise in manufacturing facilities or wherewithal to improve your margins and mm -hmm. to improve your distribution. Right. Because they already, they already have the connections. They already have the shelf space. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what we're focused on, we get asked all the time, like, why aren't you in Alabama? Why aren't you I was going to ask you, like, how are you getting around the, the, all the alcohol, like distribution? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it used to be easier. So, our biggest game changer and, you know, what really put us on the right trajectory was moving to RNDC. Um, they are in over 40 states or the second largest wine distributor in the country. But RNDC is going through, you know, its own uh, reorgs and challenges and, you know, they're, they're the small suppliers just really have to perform and really grind to remain at, on people's like radar right. and to even get shelf space. Um, we've had the most success, really a blended approach. So working hand in hand with our distributors uh, again, RNDC is our distributor in South Carolina and Tennessee. We're with Best Brands. They're a great okay. partner as well. But making sure that we massage those relationships first and get into like some of the regional plays like Harris Teeter, yeah. they're working on Fresh Market. Um, we are planogrammed or on sets for Whole Foods, which we're still trying to execute with the right <laughs> partners. So it's really like, it's like a seesaw, like, you know, one day you're up and you think you've got it figured out. And then the next day you're down again. And it's just a column, constant, like balancing mechanism of moving, moving the ball forward. Right. Um, you know, two years ago, I would have thought, oh, you know, R&DC will expand with us across their entire network. And right now they're just, uh, most of the big distributors are not doing that, especially with small or even mid-sized brands. Mm -hmm. So we've had to get creative and say, okay, we got on the planogram for, for example, natural grocers. Um, they're a great fit for us. They have 50 plus stores in Colorado. Uh, you're, I'm actually officially announcing it here, I guess. Yeah, well, yay. <laughs> yeah, yay. And, That's a win. You know, 
<laughs> we pursued um, a mid-sized distributor in Colorado that's got a really good reputation working with those regional grocery stores. That is our primary focus is grocery. Obviously, we care about our independents and on-premise restaurants and bars too. But where we've seen the most success and the highest volume is where we're going to focus because okay. that's how we're going to keep the light. On. That's right. That's right. So let me, so when you entered and you started to uh, uh, drink tipsy, did, did you have the exit in mind of like, Hey, we're yeah. going to build this in three years and let's hope that we get bought out by either a larger, you know, winery, you know, wine brand, or I could even see like a larger uh, beer brand um, to, to, you know, expand their, their offerings. Um, Absolutely. So that's always been the plan. Okay. Um, especially with an RTD, again, when you're in cans, unless you have your own manufacturing facility or brewery, the margins are more thin yeah. than they are with like a premium spirit. So, you know, the goal is always to scale it, like I said, go deep, get that volume and hyper volume in targeted markets like Nashville, Charleston, right. Atlanta, you know, Denver. We're being as strategic as we can, knowing our customer base, knowing the markets where we're going to have the best chance for success. Right. And then, you know, our goal is to exit by 2028. Okay. Um, you know, if you had asked me two years ago, it probably would have been sooner. But again, it's just challenging right now. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have five seed investors. So our first seed investor um, also is our chief administrative officer. Okay. He was um, an associate general counsel for PNC Bank. So he's also really helped me get more streamlined with contracts, improving a lot of our contracts and agreements, um, getting more buttoned up with our co-packers and our vendors and ensuring that we're not getting taken advantage of, which has absolutely happened um, too many times. Unfortunately, right. it's, a, it's tough when you are new. Um, and then the other four seed investors uh, all came in after him. So, okay. so he was um, a key, the key player. Was that, so I'm asking, is that a, like Charleston based, South Carolina based? Um, so everybody's in the Carolinas. Okay. And some are invested in other alcohol brands or CPG brands. So they, they have know. the risk tolerance, say no, you know, on, enough about the industry. And then you know, some are in sales. Ironically, three of our five are attorneys. Um, <laughs> so Which is perfect. Yeah, it, it is. But also <laughs> nerve wracking. Um, making sure all of your T's are crossed yeah. and your I's are dotted. So, and I'm just fortunate. These are people that are friends and family, and they believe in me, and they also know that I've got six figures invested in this business yeah. of my own money and success is the only option. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of founders out there. I see it all the time. And I've heard of three failures in the past six months already with other RTD brands. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I would be very wary of investing in a business where the founder has not put in either a lot of their own time and they're not paying themselves or their own money. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of people out there with great ideas and even a great product. But if they're not totally bought in, whether it's human capital or financial capital, I wouldn't trust it. Right. Um, and, you know, but I, I think I mentioned to you already that we, my husband and I flip houses. I come <laughs> from the corporate world. He's in med device sales. Like we both hustle yeah. and you really have to, if you want to be successful in this environment, in this business, it's not something where you can just, you know, 
have a great product, have great branding, post on social media. No, it is. It's an aggressive category. We, yeah. you know, I, I own a marketing firm as well as Orange Whip, and we work with a lot of distilleries and breweries and wineries. It's it is not an easy category at yeah, all, it's and especially the most competitive. And and but you're creating something that's like you're creating a new space. Um, so not only are you trying to sell. A, a direct brand, but you're also trying to sell a new category inside of this industry. Yeah. So it's a category sell that follows a, you know, a retail brand. Um, so you've you're, got, you've got two challenges. Uh, <laughs> you're totally right. It's funny you bring that up because where we said today in 2024 is kind of like where, you know, white claw and truly yeah. were, back in you know whatever years they launched probably and the and the old like they they just like refreshed the zima brand from the night yes yeah and all uh, most of those are malt based and i i don't prefer a malt based drink when i drink i drink vodka tequila or wine i drink as clean as i possibly can i don't like preservatives or fake flavors or you know ton of sugar. Like I'm not a mixer person. When I drink cocktails, it's got to be, you know, gin and the organic tonic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Same. <laughs> I can appreciate that. And, it, you know, the people say, oh, well, the category is flooded. There's so many RTDs. We're, we're what I would call a market disruptor. Like yeah. we're there are very few wine based cocktails that are clean, preservative free, and low in sugar. It's right. really, and in a can. Yeah, and in a can. Right. I, I have really like four valid competitors um, it, who I admire. And right. I want to see more competitors in my category because a rising tide lifts all boats. That's right. And, and you're the and, first entry usually wins out. The yeah, then we get more shelf space. But, you know, the retailers are starting to really understand, especially Whole Foods and natural grocers, yeah. fair, the more, you know, uh, premium grocers, they actually have a called out section in most mm-hmm. of their stores for sparkling wine or better for you. Or right. Because our price point is higher. We're going to be higher than a brewed kombucha. Kombucha is cheap right. to make. We're going to be a higher price point than a malt base right. or even a brewed tea. So, you know, I always tell people you get what you pay for. Right. And it just depends on, I guess, how, what kind of gas you want in your, <laughs> in your car, Right. Right, exactly. Well, and the fact that you're going after distributors or retailers that fit the the category as well. You're not just going, hey, let me go find and get on the shelf space of Walmart. You're sure. being very targeted intentional. And, very, and intentional, um, which makes sense. It's kind of the low hanging fruit of this who this is who fits. Yeah. Um, and and we do want to be available for everyone. I mean, we've been approached by Um, grocery stores who do not market themselves as premium. They market themselves as more accessible. And frankly, they have a lot more locations. So Mm -hmm. that's attractive to us, but we're likely not going to get there until we can continue to get our retail price point lower. Because the last thing you want to do is get shelf space and then not have the product move. Right. Uh, we discovered that very quickly and early on. If you were at a price point that's not digestible for the average consumer, the product's just going to sit. Yeah. When we launched, our average retail price was eight dollars a can. You still see a lot of products out there on the shelf at that mm-hmm. price, but now we're averaging about. 350 a can. Okay. So it's been, it's taken a lot of work to yeah. get that retail price down. Very good. Yeah. Um, so what's been, what's been the most rewarding part of your, of this whole journey? 
Honestly, what really keeps me going is when I meet people that, you know, somehow it comes up that I'm the founder of Tipsy and they're like, oh my gosh, that's my favorite product. This actually happened recently. We're meeting with a new CPA firm <laughs> and she emailed me back, the lead CPA, and she was like, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe this. This is what me and all my mom friends drink at baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was so flattered and I thought that was so special. And she's like, she sent me a photo. She's like, yes, this is my drink of choice. I buy it all the time. We have to work together. So that's, you know, the thing that really keeps me going. And I know that I'm on the right path. Um, yeah. And when we're at events, when people come up and taste the product, truly you can taste the difference between once you taste something like Tipsy and then you compare it to subpar RTDs that have, you know, a lot of subpar ingredients. Right. There is a big difference in taste and the flavor profile and the the aroma because we're using a high quality product a premium wine yeah. um instead of preservatives we tunnel pasteurize our products so it's like if you've ever met made jam or jelly or pickle yeah. stuff you know you're using heat to pasteurize and reduce any microbiological content or activities so <laughs> Same thing with Tipsy. Um, we're one of the very few brands that does that. And it's just a safer and more clean way to extend shelf life and preserve the product without right. chemicals. Oh, that's right. So you've become almost like a, a amateur or novice, uh, maybe pro food scientist. In yes. So I, I didn't anticipate any of that when we went in. Because you're like, wait a minute, I got to get into all the science behind this. And also with packaging, what's going to stay on the shelf? How do you, yes. keep, how do you keep your, your clean, you know, story? But at the yeah. same time, you got to, you got to basically ship and it's got to sit for a yes. certain amount of time. So it's, uh, um, you've had to become an expert, I'm sure. I have. And that's where the expensive lessons have come on. Um, you know, I tell people when they want to get into this business um, and I'm not going to give all of my secret sauce. You know, <laughs> it took me years and really a hundred K in mistakes. That's how yeah. many mistakes, how much mistakes have cost us. And some of that we've been able to claw back, thankfully. <laughs> um, but, you know, the co-packers, there's very little liability on their part, um, at least in the alcohol business and, and at my size. So, you know, it's, it is a wild west. And my yeah. CEO always says that because he came from banking and finance, which is so freaking regulated <laughs> and so buttoned up. And he's every week, you know, if something comes up, he's like, why am I even surprised? Like, right, right. You know, People get smart, like in the packaging and the shipping. Yeah, there is, there is very little. Yeah, um, we've right. seen forklifts go straight through pallets and people try to claim that they didn't do it. And, yeah. you know, cans exploding. We had an issue recently where cans arrived, they opened up the truck and half of the cans were on the ground. Oh. You can't physically re-sterilize those cans. You can't even send them back. They're right. done. So, you know, a lot of expensive lessons learned. Mm -hmm. And it's just manufacturing. Like, you yeah. have to have a very high tolerance for bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, you just also have to know... Uh, when it, it it has to be called out, right? Um, otherwise, you know you're you're not going to recoup those losses. That's right. So I know you don't want to give away all the secret sauce, but if you could hit rewind on yeah. anything, what would be the, the the one thing you're like I would do this differently? I honestly would have worked with a consultant, somebody who had either already founded a brand or helped develop a brand from the ground up. Mm. I do have someone now that I can lean on and we 
we don't use him as much anymore. We hire him on a project basis. Mm -hmm. um, if I had had him in the beginning or someone like him, I probably, it's not cheap, mm -hmm. but the headaches and financial burden that I would have avoided would have been worth that investment. That's right. Um, also, I would recommend if you are going to change co-packers or start working with a co-packer or manufacturer, the words are interchangeable. <laughs> um, you want to ask for references and you want to talk to those references and see how long they've been working with the co-packer. What has their experience been? What, what issues did they go through? And yes. Yeah. Um, and it's just good to be in communication with other brands. Like in the beginning, I think I, my head was so, you know, like I was just nose to the ground, focused on op sales, distribution, and not really doing a lot of networking because I felt like it was a waste of time and I didn't really have that kind of time to invest. Right. And looking back, some of the advice I've gotten from other founders has been absolutely immeasurable. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's two girl, other female founders that I'm close to who have you know, steered me away from working with certain co-packers or certain can providers. So, you know, it, it's a big industry, but at the end of the day, it's still somewhat small yeah. especially with the startup brands. And we do all talk at some point. <laughs> So I was going to ask you, one of the questions were uh, like, what is the best advice you've ever received? Whether it's from another founder or from one of your, you know, your VCs, your supporters, what's the, what's like the biggest advice that really made an impact about how you made a decision? Spend money slowly. Hmm. Um, I think when people do a raise and they've got that money flowing in, finally, they feel like, okay, I've got some cushion. I can start, you know, cutting checks to this consulting firm and advertising and social media content. And before you know it, you're not even breaking even because you're, you're outspending what you're making. And um, I actually hired a fractional COO slash CFO recently. He's a blended role. He worked for with the company as their CFO. He was there from the ground up, grew him to almost 200 million in annual wow. sales. And if, again, if I had had him at the beginning, I'd be a lot further along. Um, he has really streamlined all of our forecasting, our budgeting, our burn rates, our, you know, your when, financial operations. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And I've done a pretty good job. I mean, he was actually surprised when he came on board. He was like, I can't believe you've been maintaining this just based on, you know, my background not being in finance, my background <laughs> is in sales and marketing. So, you know, that those are the things that are worth the investment early on and not spending the money too fast because it can go very quickly. It can. Um, Shocking. I, I didn't hire a full time employee until this year after yeah. buying out my business partner. It's been just me with a few, you know, part time resources. So I was very careful um, and intentional uh, and about where money was being spent. No, that's really smart. I think, you know, if I go high, look back over the last, you know, couple since I founded Orange Whip, that is one of the biggest things I wish I would have waited on. I hired too fast. Yep. Um, and I shouldn't have, I should have contracted people. So that, yeah, I'm right there <laughs> with you. We have the, um, my full-time marketing director. She's phenomenal. She has sweat equity in the brand. That's, yeah. Um, I adore her. And finding someone that I could really trust, she actually was our social media intern and approached me about the role. And she has just done an incredible job. And 
I mean, I trust her with everything. My email yeah. login, my bank account login, <laughs> she has it all. And I know that she can handle that and she's the right person for it. But other than that, everybody else is contract help. Now that may change as we grow, of course, right. but you see a lot of brands. There's one in particular I can think of that they had to fire like basically their entire sales force because yeah. they you would too many people and their payroll and benefits and, were just absolutely. And productivity. Uh, it yeah. just hasn't like, I, you know, I could go on, on I could do a whole <laughs> podcast on just post COVID, just the productivity and the, the mindset of people coming over the last couple of years. It's just not the same. I and agree. So yeah, we, yeah. So we've had to shift on the marketing side of the business um, for, for bright. It's, you know, we had to reshift our whole onboarding, our recruitment, um, our orientation program, you know, hire really slow on board people with much more intentionality than we ever had before. Cause we had to exit people like over the last couple of years, we've done a couple of like, I would say not mass exits, but we were exiting people and, yeah. uh, and then and we would hard. hire people and they weren't, they weren't working. And we were yeah. like, why, what is going on? It's just, yeah. So then we were like, maybe we need to rethink how we, <laughs> how we hire and, um, I can appreciate that. Um, it is, it's been a lesson, lesson learned. It is. And that's emotionally draining too. I mean, any, anytime you're letting someone go or parting a relationship, it's, you know, it, it can be financially draining oh, yeah. and emotionally Emotional. draining. Yep. And, you know, I'm glad that you're through that season. Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking forward to this year. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, I think 2024 is going to be, I think we COVID and all of the ills of COVID are like metaphorically and physically are finally in the rear view mirror. That's right. That's right. We're, we're totally away from it. Everybody's focused on, you know, 2024, I think is still going to be a challenge. Um, you know, with lenders and interest yeah. rates. Well, and the industry, well, and, and consumer confidence indexes yes. are, are at some time at the all time lowest and, and, you know, coming into this year. So it'll be interesting, you know, dig, like we see this on the e-commerce side of, you know, just the ROI metrics on, you know, return on ad spend and click through rates and all that. It is, you know, we're, we've hit 2023, we hit the cap. Like yep. those are the best we'll ever see. And, and then we've got this year we've, so everything's going to just go downhill and with consumer confidence also in decline. So just from a branding marketing, it's just going to be super challenging. Um, but also I think from a business growth and employee and all that, like performance metrics, uh, I'm, you know, business lending and small business, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening on the Hill um, to help support small businesses and yes. especially women owned businesses. So I think, you know, this year will be an interesting year. <laughs> yeah, it will be. I think, you know, things are really going to have the greatest improvement in 2025. Yeah. I think a lot of 2024 is, a, you know, a positive trajectory but we've just got to get through it because, yes. you know, the economy is in Charleston. It's strong. I mean, we live obviously in a tourist centric right. uh, town. So that certainly helps, especially, you know, with the real estate market here, which we've benefited from. But um, consumer confidence, for sure. I I've heard that about the ad spend. Yeah. And, you just got to tell your story a little bit differently. I mean, that's all yeah. it's just become branding and brand storytelling is going to be, those are the brands that are going to win out. Like ones that have their media mix modeled, you know, mapped out, they've got their brand story and their user journey kind of mapped out. Those are the brands that are going to win, I think in 2024, but it also might not see, 
you know, some of that come to fruition until 2025. Exactly. So yeah, no, totally agree. This uh, is the year to put in the work. This is the year that, sure. yeah, you got to be paying attention. Yes. <laughs> to everything. <laughs> to everything. <laughs> um, so, okay. Moving, like we did a look back. If you could change anything about your business looking ahead, like in, you know, by end of 2025, where do you want your business to be? Like, what are those, you know, those milestones that you're going, man, I, I need to hit this by 2025. Yeah. So we'd like to be by tw- by the end of 2025, we'd like to be in 12 states, possibly more. Um, our revenue goals are pretty aggressive. I won't give specifics, <laughs> but we're trying to 5X. Okay. Um, our revenue from this year. Um, we're on the right path this year, opening three new states. Uh, we actually signed a distribution agreement with Empire, and wow. they are a distribution company that was acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. So I feel really good about their, you know, skill sets, they're financially sound, they've got good backing, they're growing, and that's a really positive sign. Um, And 2025 should be the banner year. We've got several retailers that, you know, are regional focused, but have also a national presence. And if we, you know, can successfully execute regionally, then we have greater opportunities to expand nationally. Is that how they work with you guys of like new brands, they test to go, look, we'll put you on these shelves, but you've got to move the product. If people don't move it off the shelf, and I'm sure they have some formula um, that, hey, if we do this, then we will take you nationally because that formula should still work. Yes. Yeah, that is part of it. And just really knowing the buyers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been surprised at how, um, how intimately some of the brokers know the buyers, like Mm -hmm. how small the industry is because these buyers, you know, they may work as a buyer at Target and then they're a buyer at Kroger and that's what they do for their entire career. And, And they're incredible. I mean, they know, their slots and their margins and what's trending. They know exactly what they want and they're just getting bombarded right now. Um, That's another thing to keep in mind. Like just because you get a buyer's information doesn't mean they want to hear from you. So (laughs) you've got to be really strategic and to the point. And I know that's just for my sales background. Like, At the end of the day, they don't care about what's in it for my brand. They care about what's in it for them. Right. How is this going to financially benefit them or give them an opportunity to have a unique head start with our product in their market? We've got to have, you know, a compelling story to really shine Mm -hmm. and you know, it's hard because the big brands, they own a lot of these, sh- a lot of the shelf space. That's right. They already, they, they take up a lot of mindset from these, of these brokers. And from they these do. Buyers already. And we've worked with brokers here and there and had success with that. Um, you know, if we could afford to do it monthly, we would because mm-hmm. it pays off. It's just, my product, it does have a level of seasonality though. Um, you know, it's a wine spritzer. You're going right. to drink more of these when it's hot outside. So right. even understanding the seasonality aspect and like when they're redoing the sets, hmm. when the, every uh, retailer is a bit different with, you know, when they do resets. So it's just... Uh, know your, it's, it's knowing your audience. Yes. Yeah. And so I mean, not only... You've got to you've got to know your audience from a consumer perspective because that's what your brand is centered on. But you have to know the audience across the entire channel. Yeah, uh, all the way, all the steps and all the touch points until you get to that consumer. Yes, everyone has a little bit of different story to tell of how you, you know, tell them the benefits of, you know, tipsy of how it's going to benefit them. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, really it's three tiers. You yeah. know, you're, you're working with your wholesaler slash distributor, then the retailers, restaurants and bars, and then the consumer. <laughs> um, so you're right. It's a, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's high touch. Right. Right. Like, you gotta, you could. Can... A lot of, lot of different stories, a lot of different nuances. Um, so, Kate, I know we're, we're, we're going to wrap up here in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. I've just got a couple last questions. Sure. Um, what has been, so you've got now, uh, I'm, I'm assuming shareholders, right? You've got these investors in your business. Yeah. What's been the most challenging um, part of, of that? They're, I know that your friends and they're, you know, probably family members, but in terms of how, how do you manage um, other people that you've, you kind of are responsible to? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we did our first seed investment uh, came in in June of 2023. And then the subsequent seed investors came between July and November. So it's still, you know, a bit new, a bit fresh, but I make it a point. I, I over communicate in general. Um, it can be a good thing or a bad thing, but we do a quarterly newsletter. Okay. We're actually going to do um, an annual review call at the end of January with all of the investors. Uh, we in our newsletter obviously are sharing, you know, financial data, right. events. They have access to events. But I want them to be engaged as well so that yeah. they know how to help support and grow the brand. Right. I mean, these are folks that are well connected in the communities they live in, and they've been great resources in some regards, like getting us into new bars, new restaurants, mm -hmm. country clubs. Legal uh, advice. <laughs> So I even provided them a high level training material and it's not a requirement, but it's like, if you really want to understand the industry and what your money is going towards, here's, you know, how things work. Here's our cell that's just, feeds. That's smart. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I want people that are invested to feel truly bought in and like they're a part of something because they are, because- right you know, we couldn't get to the growth that we've even achieved this year were it not for those investments. <laughs> um, we could have, but it would have been a lot harder and we would have had to just get more creative financially. Right. So I'm very appreciative of them. And, you know, we've been very fortunate to have um, the type of investors that we brought on board, um, they've offered advice at different points, you know, like free consulting advice. Right, right. And we'll probably do another round in Q3 of this year. Um, at that point, we'll likely be seek seeking an institutional investor. Okay. So, you know, we've waited to do that because we don't want to do that until we absolutely need to. Right. Um, right now, I still have a nice piece of equity. Right. And you're in I control. <laughs> yes. And I want to maintain that until, you know, until the appropriate time to right. get some up for the right next step. That's right. So um, if you had to like choose one word, that sums up your entrepreneurial founder journey, what word would you choose? Perseverance. Ah, that's a good one. A lot of people would have given up by now. <laughs> um, it is really hard. Um, it can be hard on a marriage, on the family. You know, there's been a lot of challenges and this is not a cakewalk by any means. Right. Um, you know, you, you mean you know, being an entrepreneur and a founder isn't, isn't easy, you know, people think it's, it's like a... sexy and glamorous and fun. And you're just, you know, traveling to cool places and going <laughs> to see your product made like, yeah, those are the fun things, but 
you know, they don't see me on my computer after I put my kids to bed and then I'm on right. the computer for three more hours banging out emails or, you know, going through QuickBooks. So there's a lot of perseverance that's required. Um, if it were easy, everyone would do it. And I always right. remind myself of that. That's right. You should be proud of what you've done. Thank you've you. got an amazing story. Thank you. Um, okay. So some fun things. You're a mom of what you said, mom of two, two girls under the age of seven and four and a half. Oh my goodness. I'm a mom of four. My kids are oh my gosh. span from 23 to 12. <laughs> well, you look amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel you of uh for of running a couple of businesses and but what do you do for your free I mean you flip houses you've got you know you you did a franchise exited and then now doing this you know crazy time flipping houses too what do you do in your free time I mean free time I do try to work out four times a week to keep myself so good clean. I like have to sweat or I am unwell I, and my <laughs> husband even can see a change in my mood when I have not consistently hit the gym um, or done hot yoga. So I'm big on that to keep myself at peace. And then I'm a health nut. Like I love, you know, cooking. I love researching recipes, supplements. I always share that knowledge with my friends um, we're very active in our church. And honestly, my kids are at the ages where I feel like I'm at a birthday party every weekend. So <laughs> thankfully, I can be the one that brings the fun drinks. That's right. Um, and it's always a hit, you know, to responsibly <laughs> drink at children's birthday parties. Right. Um, so that's really what we're like. Here comes Katie with the cooler. Yay! Yes, and that is me for sure. Um, and we love to travel. We try to take a few trips a year. I always like in the thick of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I regret this. I'm working for half the trip, but it's just the nature of where I am right now. Yeah. Um, and I'm embracing it and loving it. We we want one more child. Um, so many people have been like, I'm 41. So people are like aren't you done? Like you're kind of like out of that difficult season. They can like <laughs> get themselves dressed. They help you around the house, but we really put off having a third because I've been so entrenched right. and tipsy and, you know, house flipping. And I'm like, okay, now we're at the You can, you can do it. I had my last one at 40. You can okay. do it. <laughs> I love it. So yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about, you know, the health of the baby or having a healthy pregnancy. I think age is just a number, but That's right. I don't want my kids to be too far apart, you know, where <laughs> if, if God willing, we have a third, they're like feeling isolated, you know, they'll be How fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> Everything takes care of itself. That's right. That's right. Well, I am so glad that you share. We are, we're out of time. I try to keep these around an hour. I know we went a Love little it. over, um, but these episodes go so fast and I love the conversation. I appreciate you hanging out with us. Is there anything that you want to say that we didn't cover? And, um, and then where can people connect and find you? you know. that's, that's actually what I was going to share. So you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Katie Shields. If you just type in Katie Shields Tipsy, I should <laughs> pop up. And then Instagram, I'm just now starting to really beef up my public page. I do have a private page that I keep very tight and private because it's got photos of my children on it. Right. And I try to keep my private life private, but my public Instagram page is actually my design business. Okay. Um, so that's Atlantico Design Co. And then I've got a website as well. Everything's linked on my public. Uh, on that for, and it's drinktipsy.com, right? Correct. Yes. yes. Most okay. importantly, Most follow, impo <laughs> follow Tipsy on Instagram. Our handle is Drink Tipsy. Our website's Drink Tipsy. Um, we've got a LinkedIn page as well. 
And I'm just so happy to have connected with you and I your time today. And I'm glad that we're in the same state. We are not that far. Me too. <laughs> I appreciate it. So for everyone listening or watching us, thank you for joining in. Um, you will see this episode or hear this episode drop this coming Sunday. So go check it out. We're on all podcast platforms. And uh, subscribe to Hello Chaos. Like and comment or share. And help us grow a, and build a more connected entrepreneurial community. Hello Chaos is one of the many resources brought to you by Orange Whip. Again, that's Orange Whip, W-I-P for work in progress. Orange Whip is a multimedia company dedicated to serving founders and entrepreneurs in affiliate cities. We are 100% free. We are um, sponsored and endorsed by organizations and uh, resources that want to support founders and entrepreneurs at the local level. So we are a one-stop content hub just for founders. And we also send uh, kind of a recap every week, every Sunday afternoon. It's like, it's the Sunday afternoon. Listen to a podcast, read some stories, get connected uh, with those in your area. We are currently in three South Carolina markets, the upstate, which is Greenville, South Carolina, the Midlands, which is Columbia, South Carolina, and the Low Country. Charleston, South Carolina, with goals to expand to be in 30 markets in five years. Um, hey, check out this new edition that's going to be dropping this coming weekend. We're doing a full recap of 2023. It's going to be our thickest edition for online. When I say thickest, <laughs> it's a lot of little pages to, to go through, but um, you can hear all great stories from founders in these markets uh, that we covered all last year. Um, so, Go and subscribe, support us, check it out this coming Sunday. If you like. <laughs>